of Life magazine uh, gave a considerable and very interesting outline of the modern activities and structure of Freemasonry. Uh, to a great degree, this article pointed up the practical phases of this society and its operation in the modern world. There are some things, however, it seems to me, should be added. And uh, in so doing, we should clarify one point in connection with the subject. Namely, that Freemasonry, not being a dogmatic organization, does not attempt to formulate a credo or to present any firm system of obligations or rules relating to the beliefs or general activities of the individual. Masonic philosophy is grounded in its symbols, a vast assembly of ancient beliefs, doctrines, ideas, patterns, designs, emblems, and figures. These are offered for consideration, and the individual is invited to examine them in terms of himself, in terms of such content as he may find useful in his own life and thinking. Because of this attitude, it would not be fair or reasonable for any person to speak for masonry as a philosophy in an official capacity, but merely to present personal experience in connection with reflection upon these symbols, emblems, and basic concepts. And this morning we want to trace certain phases of these concepts uh, in the terms of our own primary interest, the interest in philosophy, comparative religion, and related fields. It is interesting and remarkable that in our modern world, with so many divided interests and activities, and for the most part so little consideration for the great monuments of traditional wisdom, that a society such as Masonry should stand and should continually remind individuals of doctrines and beliefs strange and almost unknown to them, and bring out and perpetuate uh, parts, at least fragments, of the great religious mysteries and philosophical schools of the past. Based, therefore, upon a certain broad foundation, entirely non-sectarian and non-denominational, uh, entirely, in a sense, essence and principle, non-racial, Masonry presents certain ideas, and these ideas are most of them derived originally from older sources, so that actually it is the modern uh, manifestation of a very long and old tradition. As probably most of you realize, the symbolism of masonry is derived principally or basically from the symbolism of architecture. It is a descent of ideas paralleling, if not exactly coinciding with, the Dionysian artificers of Greece, the Roman Collegia, and the cathedral builders of Europe. Thus, the entire concept relates to building, uh, to the recognition of creativity, the dignity of labor, and the inalienable right of the individual to make a positive contribution to the social life, the 
cultural existence of the world in which he lived. Under the terms of architecture, therefore, are unfolded the rules and laws governing the building of human society, which was and always has been the principal concern of the great Dionysian cult. Under the story of the house, the temple, the palace, the monument, the tomb, was always concealed uh, a series of social patterns, one of these patterns being the inevitable division of human activity, and the second, the inevitable dedication of human activity. Masonry as a group today does not demand any religious affiliation, nor does it require the individual to be orthodox or unorthodox. It requires religiously only one basic principle, namely that the candidate must, under solemn obligation, affirm that he believes in the existence of a supreme power principle or being signifying absolute good at the root of life. A materialist, therefore, is not eligible. He must believe in the sovereignty of something superior and eternal. He must recognize deity as universal mind, universal spirit, universal consciousness, or universal being. And he must accept, as part of his natural obligation, his moral duty to that being, to that supreme power, and must recognize that his earthly labors constitute his perpetual adoration of this mystery. Therefore, he labors not for himself, but in the name of a supreme architect, a great builder whose body is the universe, whose noblest masterpiece is the human consciousness, whose greatest labor is the perfection of human society. On this very broad religious footing, therefore, it is not surprising that many of the outstanding interpreters, exponents, and writers on the subject of masonry have been clergymen. They have found nothing whatever in masonry to interfere with the basic concept of the reality of God or the dignity of religion. And in various parts of the world, Masonic obligations are taken up on many sacred books, including the Koran and other writings of peoples who acknowledge the existence of one supreme being. The acknowledgement of this existence the to the builders from the very earliest time set them in their way of life. All labor was a form of prayer. And we can go back to the ancient Essene formula uh, that probably was involved in the first beginnings of Christianity. The Essene sect in Syria declared that the sweat of honest toil was the true water of baptism. And that the individual who did not labor to build a better world was lacking in the essential principles of religion. Religion is not merely the salvation of self. It is the preservation and extension of good throughout the world and throughout the entire uh, sphere of human activity. The truly religious person was a builder, contributing something, leaving this world in some way better than he found it. And while it is not necessarily uh, true, that the builder must be a carpenter or a bricklayer or a stonemason. Still, on some level, scientific, artistic, cultural, religious, philosophical, mystical, on some level of his activity, the true worshiper is a builder, a creator, one who is releasing through himself the tremendous dynamic of universal potential. Now, in the early days, of the operative crafts at a time when organizations such as masonry were concerned principally with 
trades, with occupations themselves, with the actual physical performance of the duties of the builder, the contractor, the carpenter, the stonemason. During these days, the members gathered together in a great system known as the guild. Hans Schatz and the uh, Meistersingers of Nuremberg sings the glory of the guild. And these guilds uh, more or less preceded and anticipated the trade union and later the labor union organizations of the world. The difficulty with nearly every organization, however, that has grown out of the guild has been that the, such organizations have perpetuated only a part of the great guild tradition. Today we think largely of labor organizations as protecting the right of the laborer to reasonable compensation for his endeavors. To the older groups, the guild was the temple. The guild was the moral structure which dominated and controlled and directed the activities of the individual. To, uh, in giving allegiance to the guild, uh, the member did not break his allegiance with his country, with his family, with his neighbor, with society in general, nor did he compromise his allegiance to God. In the service of the guild, he gave a new meaning to all of these things, applying them directly to the principles by which he sustained himself on an economic level. Therefore, the guild meeting, whether it was a carpenter's guild, or a plumber's guild, or a tailor's guild, or a watchmaker's guild, the guild meeting opened with a simple but solemn sacrament of dedication. The individual who made shoes was perfectly convinced and was taught to accept without question that this useful labor was a form of worship. That the individual who built houses built not only for the profit of the selling of the house or for the wages which he earned, but he built with a solemn hope in his heart that he was creating a home in which human life would be better, in which families would be strong, and in which children would grow up in a happy atmosphere to honor their parents and worship their God. He felt that he was laboring for a principle beyond profit. And it was this overtone, this principle beyond profit, it was actually the glory of the guilds. It was this principle which maintained the high integrity of these ancient uh, labor organizations and prevented them from falling into the difficulties which fill our newspapers today in connection with organized labor. It would have been utterly impossible in those days for a leader of a guild to have absconded with the funds of the group. It would have been utterly incredible that these individuals you would have used any unfair, unreasonable method for attaining their ends. They did not need to. They lived in a social order in which the guild had certain inevitable prerogatives. It had rights and privileges which could not be assailed. These rights were the rights of directing the activities of the group itself, maintaining its place in society, and instructing and educating each member of the guild so that wherever he went, and under whatever position or condition he found himself, he was a truly noble representative of the collective group from which he came. It was therefore incredible that a member of a guild in good standing to adulterate his product, perform shoddy labor, cheapen his way of doing things, or build into his project anything inferior, unworthy, or unreasonable. It was a disgrace to himself and a disgrace to his guild, for each action that he performed either elevated or lowered the collective respectability of his group. Therefore, he was not likely 
in any way to damage his own reputation or to break faith with those who employed him or use any unfair means for accomplishing any desired end. His being was his faith in action, his respectability, his career. It was his code, his conscience, his creed in action. This concept carried with it a number of overtones which have no longer survived to us in practical activities. World conditions have changed, arrangements of mankind have altered, and by degrees the barriers or walls of the guilds have been broken down. But most of all, in our modern way of life, the average person has forgotten, ignored, or chosen to disregard the great ethical overtones of labor. He has no longer the feeling that by what he does, he is forever honoring the great power which is the source of all things. Now in the dual system, uh, we have one of the most valuable and useful uh, common instruments of education. And that instrument is the dual theory of progress through apprenticeship. In ancient times, nearly all learning was communicated on the level of action. There was very, very little theoretical knowledge as we know it today. Those who knew taught. And no man taught what he did not know. The individual also did not teach on the basis of theory. He taught by example. He taught by doing the thing well. And all instruction was based upon the actual performance of the labor itself. Thus, when members sought to join the various guild groups, they were placed under apprenticeship system. This apprenticeship policy, to succeed and to be valuable, had to uh, be centered around the power of the masters of the guild to teach. They had to have outstanding actual attainment. The individual did not go to school and study carpentry from a teacher who had never used a plane or driven a nail. He did not learn from books. He did not learn in mass. Nor did he learn and pass on paper the examinations of his craft. He performed the actions, and his apprenticeship was considered to be complete when it was shown and demonstrated by his own ability that he had mastered the principles, was able to apply them easily and naturally and skillfully, and at the same time that his moral character had so developed and his recognition of the dignity of his labor had so deepened that it was almost inconceivable that he would in any way use shortcuts or easy methods that might be detrimental to the final integrity of the product. Thus the apprenticeship came into existence as a system. It is the system that goes back to the dawn of time. It even goes into the animal kingdom, where the young animal grows by a kind of an apprenticeship. It, grow, grow, it grows by doing what the older animals do, watching them, observing them taking upon itself their laws, their ways, and their habits. Thus, by observation and by doing, the individual gains a peculiar skill. Now, it is obvious that today the apprenticeship system is not in vogue in most instances. There are some cases where it is. But again, it has been weakened. Because today the apprentice is passing through a miserable period of adjustment in which he is striving primarily to earn the wages of a master. His only, 
concerned being how soon he can get top pay. This was not the ancient way. For in the old guild system, frequently, the master did not make great wages. Because the master might be so dedicated to his labor that he would spend far more time and energy than he was compensated for in the process of producing a better piece of work. The uh, great compensation of the master in the trade or the union was that other men should say that his work was outstanding. He was not measured by his pay, but by a reputation built upon the complete adequacy of his knowledge and the high standard of his product. Thus, in the apprenticeship system, we had the beginning of this idea of growing by degrees. The individual passed from one state of learning to another, beginning with the simplest lesson which he had to master. And then as he had achieved adjustment and achieved skill, the little ceremony of his advancement into another level in which still further skill was induced or further knowledge was communicated. It was the right and privilege of the guild masters to bestow their choicest secrets and their greatest um, attainment in skill and knowledge and experience to those apprentices who gradually merited this special consideration. Here again we have a word introduced that is very important, and that is the merit system. The system in which the individual has to earn that no arbitrary uh, consideration could be substituted for it. A man could not enter a guild because he had the price. A consideration could be substituted for it. A man could not enter a guild because he had the price. He could not enter into the guild and of other lines of activity. Had to begin as apprentices and perhaps go for years humbly obedient to a local carpenter in order to earn their right to be seated in the council of the guild. There was practically no possibility of the individual buying his way in for the reason that there is no way of buying experience, nor is there any way of bestowing uh, that internal uh, understanding which must come from knowing and doing and serving. So the apprenticeship system became the foundation of the great uh, economic and industrial pattern of the ancient and medieval worlds. It was the apprenticeship system which produced the cathedral builders, these tremendous groups of artisans who labored together competitively without few with almost no problem such as we recognize today, each receiving the wages that he was entitled to, and each one recognizing that his greater pay lay in the glory of his labor. The gradual loss of this psychology has brought with it a great deal of human difficulty. For one, re one thing, it has set so many people at animosity with their work. Work is a drudgery. It is simply a means of making a living. It is a painful necessity. And as the overtone of the dignity of the thing that is done, pride in natural and simple but true achievement, as this type of reaction uh, diminished, we found more and more dissatisfaction among people who had to form various groups or alliances in the perpetuation of their trade or even of their individual endeavors. So we have this beginning in the system of guild training. Now guilds also stood for something in the ancient world, and particularly in the medieval world, 
which we don't appreciate so well today, and that was the problem of education. Modern Freemasonry is particularly concerned with education. It regards education as absolutely necessary to the maintenance of a democratic and free way of life. Now, education in the old days was a haphazard problem. It was divisible into only one or two major brackets and was largely dominated by theory. Education also had extraordinary boundaries which limited the possibility of the average person taking advantage of it. In the innumerable small villages and towns that scattered through Europe during the medieval or Middle Ages, uh, middle medieval world or Middle Ages, there were very few schools. What there were were nearly always associated with the cloisters. Only a small percentage of the people could read or write. The possibility of higher education and educational advantage as we know it today, these things did not exist. Therefore, the guild had to take over the problem of education. And we have to remember that we are told that Christopher Columbus received his education from a guild in Genoa. The guilds, of course, were not uh, institutions of higher learning for the most part. But the guilds did emphasize the fact that there were two kinds of education. The uh, schooling, uh, which was difficult to secure, and which had large to, largely to do with the development of special mental attitudes or mental abilities. There was also a general education, an education which might make a man educated even though he could not read or write, because it gave to him a, a, a foundation in principles, in values. It could take the simplest person, perhaps illiterate, would never darken the door of the schoolroom and help that individual to recognize the sovereign dignities of his responsibilities to his God, to his family, to his country, to his neighbor, and to himself. Therefore, that this individual, in whatever level he might be, perhaps he was a fishmonger, perhaps a sailor going down to the sea in ships, but whatever he happened to be, he was a better human being. And being a better human being, he was a nobler ornament in the world in which he lived. This creation, therefore, of ways of becoming better, of gaining an essential kind of knowledge, not a knowledge that necessarily was a substitute for skill in mathematics or art or things of this nature, but a knowledge with which other education could work cooperatively and constructively, but a kind of knowledge without which all other kinds of education must fail. So there was a basic principle which should and must be disseminated throughout the basic levels of human society, namely that man is never truly educated until he is truly good that there can be and must be a perpetual dissemination of principles, that this man must be honest, sincere, honorable in his dealings, conscientious, willing to accept his responsibilities, unwilling to misrepresent or fabricate, respecting the rights, properties, lives of his associates, and dedicated in every way possible to such actions as would advance the common good on the level on which he functions. Thus, a kind of basic education, which might extend far beyond the boundaries of the guild, came to be part of the overtone of guild apprenticeship. Most of the guild masters were devout men. They lived simple, often stern, firm lives. Uh, they were very much like the patriarchs of old. They had their dignities and their honors, which could not be easily compromised. And they had 
a rough, ready paternalism for those who were to follow after them. It was the unwritten but inevitable duty of the guild master that his secret must not die with him. In the course of years, he must find those who would carry on. And when he was convinced that he had found a successor, then he bestowed upon him all of the good of his knowledge, all of the skills and aptitudes which he had gained. This was his duty, because he was not only the leader of the guild, but he was the father of the new guildsmen who were to come on, who must carry on and keep the work of the world going. As master, he laid a stone, and he laid it true and firm, so that those who came after could place another stone upon it with absolute assurance. He must leave this power, not only the good foundation, but the skill to place another stone. And this he did by giving his secret and communicating his knowledge to those whom he regarded as worthy. They became, within the guild, his sons. The future bearers of his glory, and he must pass on to them his good reputation, his knowledge, his ability, and his blessing. It was a very simple but very firm structure, and it resulted in the survival, in many ways, of the strength of this tremendous power which we call the middle class of humanity. Beneath the surface, the upper crust, which is ever-changing and being blown and tossed about by political, military, economic situations, this rise of the sudden rich, this fall of the sudden rich, all these levels above on the surface of which men live must be supported by this vast body of people who must be, which must be right, which must be essentially true. And while it may lack the brilliance and glitter of the intellectual. It is the tremendous honesty, the tremendous sincerity, the instinctive conscience of the great body of mankind that must preserve the world. And it was to keep this conscience clean, to keep this foundation true, that the ancient guilds labored so carefully and so wisely. Now, very often in the descent of guild knowledge, from master to master. Secrets were also communicated that transcended the general knowledge of the time. The laws of the guilds were derived from laws of nature. They were also derived from principles of mathematics, astronomy, music, and all the tremendous geometrical and uh, higher mathematical formulas that had been part of ancient learning. The guild master might not be able to define all of these elements, but he used them every day. Just as the great artist instinctively uses proportion and uses dynamics in the arrangement of his compositions, these masters, because they were practiced, not only perpetuated old laws, but continually rediscovered them. There is an ancient document relating to this that is rather interesting, namely that the Carpenters Guild in one European city, in the building of one of the townhouses, or one of the guild halls, uh, issued a statement of the principles of universal knowledge that they had rediscovered in the building of this structure. These principles refer to almost every branch of human experience. For in the setting of the timbers, in the bracing of the house, in problems of stress and strain, and in all these intricate matters, these guildsmen rediscovered the eternal principle, laws that had always been, and regarded themselves as peculiarly fortunate and privileged because they had actually been able to see the universe unfold as a result of their own labor. They were copying abstract principles, discovering why they were true, and in this way, as they expressed it, not only becoming truly and deeply astonished, but ever more reverent and worshipful, worshipful in their understanding of the divine principle 
that was at the root of all these wonderful archetypal truths. Thus the combination of labor with thoughtfulness, the recognition that we learn by doing. Not only do we learn what is necessary for the doing, but we also learn many other things, extending out into other phases of our living, so that the laws governing the guild were also good laws in the society, in the home, in the family. They were the laws of order, of reasonable and proper growth, of the unfoldment of young things into their maturity, of the greater responsibilities of advancing years, and also rest and refreshment for the aged. And it was among the guilds, for example, that there arose the two great problems, which were mentioned and stressed as early as a thousand years before the beginning of the Christian era. And these two problems were the care for the young and the protection of the aged. It became the duty of the guild to make certain that those who labored in it and who gave their lives in the useful work of building a better world should receive in turn certain protection in time of need. And therefore in the old communities that were governed by the guild laws, there was no problem of the neglected widow, no problem of the orphan child, no problem of the forgotten agent. These were part of a great, complete concept. And the very obligations of the guild bound the individual to the protection and care of those who, in, who were in need. And he became the protector of the innocent, the weak, and the forlorn. Thus his guild labor caused him to be a less glamorous, but no less useful knight errant. As in the days of chivalry, the knights went out in shining armor to protect the weak, and the knight and the order of knighthood incidentally was a guild, so the simpler guilds of the clothers and the farmers and all these other groups had their orders of chivalry, their natural uh, obligation by which they performed those extra labors, those other things not immediately demanded of man, which he could evade if he wished to be smugly self-centered. But there could be no self-centeredness in this, because the world finally was the great guild, and all of those who labored in it were working toward the same great end, and were entitled to the same cooperation and help. There could be no happiness for any man if those around him were not able to have the necessities and securities of life. The Dionysian artificers, with their great concept of universal building, bestowed upon Athens, the great city of Greece, the glory for which it is greatly and eternally remembered. Athens was the ancient citadel of democracy, and while it passed through numerous vicissitudes, it was in this tremendous culture that the concept of the World Guild Social came into existence. Democracy arose from guild consciousness. It arose from the equality of the labors of men. It was based upon the fact that individuals of different abilities, of different levels of intelligence, might perform different labors, but all these labors, if sincerely and honorably done, were equally necessary for the security of the whole world. Therefore, among those who labored, the only prerequisite was the honor of the work. And in the Athens we see the concept of the guild of the equalities of opportunities, the right of each individual to the inalienable pursuit of life, happiness, improvement, and security. These things were guild 
principles of the ancient Dionysian mysteries, and gradually they came into their first great political flowering in Greece. Here, for the first time, the guild laws were applied to a great city. And while these laws held, and while this city was able to maintain the integrity of these concepts, it produced this golden age of learning, a golden age which has perhaps never been equal in the cultural story of mankind. But Athens was the city of the democracy of men recognizing a common brotherhood, a common responsibility, and a universal God, so that truly deity was the parent of all creatures and all men were brothers. This realization carried through into the glory of the medieval guilds. And while, of course, human nature was such that none of these things can be perfected by imperfect creatures, still the tendency and the quality and the tone of the guild was paternal and fraternal. It sought to protect and advance, and it also preserved the rights of its members to self-expression, uh, to the various duties and needs which ensured their honest and sincere abilities and privileges. All these things then flowed down to form part of the great transitional motion that affected the world after the Renaissance. In the Renaissance and the Reformation, we find the emerging of guild consciousness into society in general. By that time, nearly all of Europe was organized into guilds. These guilds had values. These guilds had principles, policies, concepts which were disseminated throughout the of society, throughout society, but beneath the level of the immediate and the obvious. Millions of persons, not even perhaps in common communication, were therefore of a common mind. And that common mind had to do uh, with the rights of the individual to grow the right of the individual to think, to have a life of his own, and to share his opinions and convictions with other men, the right of the individual to have a vote or a place in the laws and in the policies which govern the group to which he belongs. The masters of the guild had the right uh, to a certain legislative authority. And those who earned mastery through their growth and labors were entitled to have something to say about the management of the organizations to which they belonged. Thus, while the great courts of Europe were locked in their own um, autocratic ways, the people were gradually developing a strong social fabric, a fabric which ultimately broke through uh, its limitations and flowed into the objective life of the individual and the collective. And so we find the great rise of humanism. We find the rise of the democratic principle and the emergence of man uh, from mental restriction into new capacities and new abilities for thoughtfulness and for progress. Now it is quite obvious that under the stress and strain of such conflicts there would be strong differences of opinions. It is quite certain that the so-called authoritarian would object to the rising tide of the guilds and the guild psychology. The autocrat would fear democracy. Uh, the dictator would fear universal education. Individuals whose futures and whose success depended upon the enslavement of minds would resent the freeing of those minds. It was obvious 
that when man became a self-motivating being, capable from within himself of planning his own destiny intelligently, wisely, and constructively, that there would mean a tremendous change in the position of society. It would move the entire fabric onto a merit system. Now, very often, society at that time was governed without any regard for merit. Uh, the leader, who by wealth or by military power alone or by despotism or by birth had attained position of authority, might or might not be actually capable of administering it wisely or unselfishly. The history of European politics for a thousand years was largely a history of tyranny, with a few uh, benevolent exceptions. Thus, arbitrary leadership, depending upon wealth and the army, would fear or would uh, be gravely anxious if there was the possibility of the human mind suddenly escaping from bondage, escaping from the long-established rules which had been psychologically imposed upon it. The struggle for liberty in the last 500 years of human history has therefore been the struggle of the human being to attain those things which were necessary and proper to him. Very often this struggle has been unreasonable. Very often it has gone off the deep end, as in the story of the French Revolution. Frequently it has been exploited and abused, and one level of autocracy has been swept away, only that another might be imposed upon the people. So-called democratic leaders under temptation have come themselves to be autocrats. And the story goes on. Yet in spite of all of the elements of the story, all of the mistakes that have been made, all of the cataclysmic crises that have come perhaps almost unnecessarily into existence, in spite of all of, it, of these things, the story of human growth has gone on. And that story of human growth is now firmly grounded in the conviction that the free man must be intelligent and that only the intelligent man can be free. Therefore, that freedom, instead of a great opportunity, is a profound responsibility. That the individual who really desires to be a self-governing creature must be peculiarly and specially educated for that purpose. He must pass through his apprenticeship in the concept of personal freedom. He must earn his right to have the wages of the master. And these wages are the privileges and opportunities that freedom bestows. But in order to have these things, he must be fit to receive them. And in order to fit, be fit to be a free man in a free world, he must attain that condition of internal conscience in which his freedom cannot cause him to perform an action contrary to the good of others. There can be no freedom while an individual is capable of perverting his own rights. As long as he is only thinking of freedom as his right to be selfish, there can be no true freedom, and man will stand constantly in the danger of having his uh, free institutions overwhelmed. Not overwhelmed primarily by his enemies, <coughs> but overwhelmed by the enemy in himself, his own selfishness. If he lives only for what he can get, he endangers the right of man to be free, because he proves by so doing that freedom is not a benefit, but a liability. And freedom must always be a liability until the free man has chosen his own code of life and has made this code adequate to the powers and privileges which he enjoys. So in the more recent time of things, 
the great problem of building a free world has taken the place of the cathedral buildings and the monument buildings of the Middle Ages. Today we are not so primarily concerned with physical architecture. We are concerned with moral architecture. We are concerned with the creating of the workmen who must build the invisible but real temple which must house such great projects as the United Nations. The United Nations cannot succeed because of a house of glass and steel in New York City. It can only succeed because the builders of human progress unite to sustain and create the invisible house of brotherhood among men. Until this house of universal good, the archetype of world peace, is established and is then served by the faithful guildmasters, the faithful builders on every level, some of you of, of which must use the wood, others must bring the water, some will supply the material, others will put them in place, but the whole of mankind must be organized into one great team if world peace is to build its house among men. To create this tremendous team, there has to be a kind of education that is a little different from the schooling that we know. Because the schooling that we know has not produced this team. The schooling that we know has not prevented antagonisms and animosities among people. The schooling that we know has not produced the intelligent, practical idealist. It has not given the individual the kind of education which causes him to dedicate his abilities to his dreams. It has not caused him to put principles first in all things, and until he does so, he lives precariously and dies tragically. So the great problem of guild life moved from the physical, the visible, and the obvious, with its overtones, to a more positive footing. Man's life shifted from his physical existence in small villages to his mental existence in a large world. He now realizes as never before that his society as he knows it is his own collective mind. It can be no better than his own heart and mind, for what we term the way of life as we know it originates in our minds and emotions, and until these are refined, disciplined, and civilized, we cannot have a civil state of relationship between human beings. This is all defined uh, civilization as that state in which men live together cooperatively and at peace. By this definition, we've had very little civilization up to the present time. We have had merely scientific barbarism. We've had a state in which the individual has used his knowledge to advance himself at the expense of others. The guildman would say that such an effort, such a program, is really attempting to advance oneself at the expense of God. Because the service of God is the service of others. To neglect others is to neglect God. To work against others is to work against good. And where this situation is allowed to prevail, the blessings of freedom, democracy, liberty, and these cherished terms which we so devoutly speak, but so seldom sustain in action, these terms cannot have their right and proper meaning. So in the 17th century, we find a great change taking place in the guild. This does not mean that the old operative guilds cease to exist. It does mean, however, that gradually uh, the guilds forming themselves into what we call a Masonic fraternity began to shift their pattern from the mere physical trades and crafts to the rise of what might be termed 
speculative masonry. By this we mean, and the term is used sometimes differently within Masonic work, by speculative masonry we mean masonry seated now in the mental life of the individual. Some say that Elias Ashmole, the famous English antiquarian, and the founder of the Ashmolean College at Oxford, was the first gentleman mason. Now, by a gentleman mason, we do not mean the first mason who was a gentleman. We mean, rather, the first mason to be accepted who had no building trade. He was not a stone cutter. He was none of these things. But he was permitted to join with others who were in various trades. The answer was, of course, that the guilds were recognizing a new trade. They were recognizing a new uh, profession or a new craft. And that was the craft of knowledge, in the sense of abstract knowledge. Ashmole was a great scholar. And so he was likewise a creative artist. He was laboring to help to spread knowledge. And this was just as much a craft as pagan Jews. So in accepting Ashmole into their own group, these craftsmen honored scholarship as a craft. And Ashmole was properly uh, pleased because he suddenly was taught or was given to understand that knowledge was useful. It was no longer an ornament. It was not something that the individual learned in order that he could argue with his friend. Knowledge was now to make its contribution to the great collective progress of things. The painter, the musician, the sculptor, the poet, the astronomer, the physicist, these men were the new guild. They were the ones who, to whom must be passed on the great Dionysian dream. The dream that everything that men do must be done for the good of men. As Lord Bacon expresses it in the New Atlantis, that all men shall learn all that is necessary and possible, and that all that is learned shall be applied to the total good of man. So the hill walls open. And the carpenter gave place to the chemist. Uh, the tailor gave a, a place perhaps to the theologian. But all of these groups were similarly dedicated. Dedicated that knowledge should not be for itself alone, but for the good that it could do. So the new guilds began to broaden. By degrees, Within 50 or 75 years, most of the guild unions of England particularly became speculative groups. There were still uh, members of the operative guild, but these operative guildsmen uh, were finding their release in other ways now, and the guild work was passed on to these intellectual groups. And from such groups, indirectly, we gain the realization that Sir Isaac Newton, for example, was the president of one of these guild groups for a long time. And Sir Christopher Wren, the great architect who built St. Paul's Cathedral, was a master of his guild. His guild now being a guild of researchers, a guild of men seeking to broaden the limits of understanding, as in the case of the Royal Society of England, which after it had been brought into existence in the advancement of knowledge, immediately communicated with foreign nations, even sending to India and China and other distant places for scientific information. The progress of growth set in, and the one thing that differed between the guild of knowledge and the learned societies of today 
For today we have practically every profession, every craft, every art and science organized in some way, mostly for purposes of protection only. We have, for instance, things like the American Medical Association, and we have the legal societies. We have the psychological societies. We have, within these groups, smaller branches. We have philosophical societies. Most of them established to maintain certain rules and ways of order. But behind this uh, still rests this foundation of the guild concept. And this guild concept has gradually come to be neglected in practically all learned societies. These societies have gradually lost sight in various ways of the essential reason for their own existence. They exist not to protect their own members alone, but to advance the total good of mankind. The purpose of the medical fraternity is not primarily to protect the doctor alone, nor is it primarily to protect the patient alone. The final end is the dedication of the healing art to the total service of man and the total glory of God. And until this happens, something is missing. And in the pattern as it is today, the thing that is usually missing is God. Today, the sacredness of skill has been generally disregarded. That it is admirable, we admit. That it is wonderful, we acknowledge. And we give great plaudits to the person possessing it. But we have forgotten that the tremendous burden of the skill lies in the acceptance of the responsibility which it brings into existence. For the possession of an ability challenges the individual to the dedication of that ability upon the altar of living and eternal truth. So gradually, learned societies became more and more immersed in their own human problems. Scientific organizations became so interested in the advancement of knowledge that they forgot to use it. Finally, when they did get around to using it, they bound it into an economic situation so tight that in many instances those who need most can have least. By degrees, then, the vital values of the great over-system uh, were ignored, forgotten, or at least neglected. And through this came the gradual rise of societies and organizations, either Masonic or based upon its principles, cutting through practically every division of human society, bringing today into integration members of all professions, all crafts and trades, from the highest to the lowest, but uniting them in a strange way, almost like some United Nations program. Uniting them not on the level of their knowledge alone, but on the level of their integrity as human beings, a matter of the greatest and most vital significance today. Out of this entire concept also has come the realization that there is a common kind of need that is just as much experienced by the atomic physicist as it is experienced by the carpenter, the plumber, or the bricklayer. This common need is the need for peace, the need for security, the need for internal integration. The individual not only must advance various lines of activity, but he must live with himself. He must find in his own nature peace of mind and peace of soul. And to do this, he must have dedication beyond material achievement. No individual can do his best or be his best while he works for himself. 
And when he works only for a dollar, he is working for even less than himself. The only reason why we can find great joy in our labor is when we are convinced within ourselves that the things we are doing are important. And to be truly important, they must make a valid contribution to the total good of our world. Not only now, but to establish foundations for future good in future times. Thus the validity of our labor is closely associated with the integrity of our motives. By this system, then, the development of a concept, an over-recognition, that all of the works of men are suspended from the plan of God, that all of the things that we are doing have some relationship to the advancement of total nature, that what we call growth is merely divinity unfolding through us, and that the life within us is a sacred thing that cannot be profaned without penalty. The individual, therefore, who is not true to his own abilities, true to the life moving through him, true to the conviction which he most secretly holds to be true, this individual is creating conflict, conflict which will ultimately destroy himself and deprive the world of much of the good that he could have bestowed upon his fellow men. To meet these problems, therefore, uh, many modern persons have begun to re-evaluate uh, the symbolism of ancient philosophies and religions, seeking for the basic roots of idealism, seeking for those essential keys by which mankind can be advanced to a state of security. Now, it is perfectly obvious that in this day and under these conditions, that there will be strong divergences of opinions even on these matters. It is true for the most part that the individual is more inclined to compromise his, compromise his ideals for profit than he is to compromise his profit for ideals. Therefore, it is also obvious that wherever large groups of persons gather together under any broad pattern, all will not be of equal integrity. But there will be, and usually is, some good to be found or to be gained wherever there is a voluntary association of human beings for the purpose of attaining good. And while this sincerity is at least reasonable, or at least partly active, some essential advancement will be achieved. Now, there is, as I have said, no formal statement in masonry relating to the particular action of any individual relating to his moral or spiritual life, but he is brought into, content, uh, into contact with symbols, with concepts, which in many cases undoubtedly unfold or constitute his basic religious convictions. And to many men in this country, Masonry is a powerful moral ethical force, supplying them with certain elements of character building, which they would not likely uh, find emphasized in the world around them. Uh, these characteristics are intended to supplement what might be termed the normal educational advantages of the person. Masonry does not believe in restraining or restricting education. It believes in exposing the individual to all possible useful knowledge. But it also reminds us that we can educate a maniac, that we can bestow knowledge upon a person totally incapable of using it wisely, and therefore that there must be and should be at all times a present program, an open invitation to wise usage, and through the dignity and importance
importance of so large an organization as Freemasonry with a clearly defined level of attitude, many men, millions of men in this country have found a practical proof that principles which they re may have regarded as being dead are still alive, and that these principles are inviting them to join with us of their kind, to join with an illustrious line that goes back for centuries of persons who have taken their basic Masonic obligations, fully recognizing that these obligations in no way interfere with their duty to God, their country, their family, their neighbor, or themselves. That there is in these obligations nothing of treason, nothing of atheism, nothing of addiction to any particular creed, no restraint of the individual to the activity of his own conscience, the actual obligation being to be himself, to be true to himself, and to be true to those great principles which are locked within him and which are the basis of world idealism, to be true to truth and to realize that the only way that he can be true to truth is to become first aware of its existence, next respective to it, willing to acknowledge it, willing to humble himself in the presence of it, next to take the necessary disciplines and to be tried and to be tested as to his integrities. And finally, having attained to a certain degree of adjustment, having earned the wages of a master, that it is then his responsibility to call together his apprentices and to communicate to them and exemplify for them by his own conduct those basic social principles upon which the survival of our world must depend. There is in this concept, then, tremendous emphasis upon the gradual unfoldment of principles. The individual is not born fully matured, nor does he by mere physical activity alone attain maturity. He is born once into this world at the time of his nativity, but he must be born a second time. He must be born into his mental, moral, spiritual maturity. He does this not by affiliation with a creed, but by reestablishment of contact with the eternal within himself. Now this contact is not easily to be established. But if the individual is quiet, if he relaxes the external and artificial pressures of his living, he will make the astonishing discovery in most cases that he is actually a better person than he knew. He will realize that within himself, perhaps slumbering, are dreams, are hopes, that also within himself is a deep-rooted sense of fair play, and that actually each individual has available, if he will call upon it, sufficient knowledge, sufficient understanding, and sufficient intuitive perception to know what is right for him. If he will cling to that right, sacrificing to it all other things, the power of that right will grow within himself, and he will, by degrees, ascend this particular and special ladder of mysteries, and will gain ever greater consolation and ever greater usefulness through dedication. To do this uh, is no more than is the natural right of man. And in these activities, masonry and other fraternal orders are serving very useful purposes in society because they are maintaining very strongly the dignity of humanity in a time when the average person is exceedingly thoughtless about these values. 
Now, there are many complaints in and outside of Masonic lodges concerning the failure of many of the deeper issues of Masonry to be clearly vitalized even among members. This, however, is one of those situations in which we cannot escape from human limitation. On the other hand, we can and do expose individuals to opportunity for growth. No one can grow for another. No one can require and demand our voluntary allegiance. And no allegiance other than that which is voluntary is valid. If we can try or do try to force virtue, wisdom, or maturity upon other people, we place them in a false position. We damage them more than we help them. For an individual who tries to live above himself is in constant misery. If, however, the individual can be inspired to search among the ancient landmarks, landmarks which were placed there by the noblest of all human beings, Landmarks which are traced to the great teachings of Plato, Aristotle, Buddha, Confucius, Lao Tse, Manu, Zoroaster, Moses, Christ. These great monuments, if they are heeded, if they are brought more and more to the attention of mankind, gain respect not only because of their integrity, but because down through the ages the best of mortals have honored them, and the best of mortals have not been ashamed to follow them. In a sophisticated era, therefore, the realization that true dignity, true attainment, a true superiority, if we wish to call it that, lies rather in following in the footsteps of the immortals, choosing our allegiance from that which is truly great, rather than following in the footsteps of passing fads and fancies, which will leave nothing important, no solid foundation upon which to build a future good. Thus it may happen that if the individual discovers that there are several million men in this country who have assumed obligations of thoughtfulness, have actually restated in their own way that they are suspending their lives from principles rather than from passing policies. The other, other young people rising up, growing up, find that good things also have their fashion, that the world is not composed totally of unbelievers, that the world is not composed totally of persons without at least a recognition of values. This encourages other persons to realize that in their hopes and in their dreams and in their ideals they are not alone. And to many persons who have believed that perhaps a handful of citizens alone carried their thoughts, the study of masonry has come as an amazing revelation. They realize that the great institutions which we long consider dead are not dead. Perhaps they are sleeping, but they are not dead. They are being carefully watched and lovingly guarded, not always with full insight, but certainly with the deepest respect, veneration, and good intention. And from these things, uh, the concept of a Masonic philosophy gradually integrates. Integrates not within the statement of the craft itself, not by official pronouncement of the fraternity, but in the life of the member or the individual. This philosophy of growth, of essential growth, that man must mature step by step by the voluntary acceptance of the challenge of knowledge, that he must grow and develop not by hearing, not by seeing, but by doing, that he is a craftsman, that he is working with his equivalents 
of the mallet and the chisel and the square and the compass. That he is actually a builder, building the careers of his children, building the ethics of his business, building the strength of society, building the strength and security of his nation, building the peace of the world. And all this building, he might at first think to be for his own advantage. And to a measure it will be to the advantage of man. He may not believe that he will ever live to see the perfection of the thing that he is doing. For he is working upon an everlasting house. But he knows that today, in the building of the temple, his real temple, the problem that confronts him, is a temple built without the a voice of workmen or the sound of hammers. It is a building eternal in nature. It is the building of a better world. Yet even in this it is not enough. Because this eternal building, this eternal remedy, repairing, redeeming of that false structure of Babel, this new temple built of contrition, devotion, acceptance, and dedication only succeeds if the builder realizes that universal architecture, moral architecture, is religion. That religion is actually the individual building the house of God in his own heart, in his home, in his society, and in his world. Therefore, that the builder is the eternal priest that he is serving not for himself nor for physical things alone, but that the glory of the Lord might be, make, may, might be made manifest. That he is building the house of God for the perfect society, the absolute commonwealth, the complete democracy, that which is the true abiding place of men, one people united in labor under the sun, that this is the great work. This is the magnum opus. This is the great transmutation of alchemy by which all base inclinations and instincts in man are transformed into the purest substances. This is the discovery of the elixir of life, the remedy against the death of discord. This is the true search for the restoration of the mysteries. This is the building of the house which is eternal. And regardless of what we do, we are builders, or else we are failing to build. And to gain a new concept of religion, a working concept, a concept in which we worship by advancing the will of the law in nature, that we worship by releasing God, which is the good in all things, that we worship also through the gentle and natural fraternity. For when we serve man, we serve God in man. And it is important that in the act of true service, that we are expressing our own divinity and worshiping the God in another at the same time. These principles, simple, direct, are the principles of the guilds. They do not interfere with any formal program of learning. They ensoul it. They enrich it. They require no individual to follow any creed or cult. They simply tell him to take the knowledge that he has, the skill that he has, the hopes that he has, and dedicate them totally upon the living altar of eternal good. In this way, he builds a better life. In this way, he advances all ends which are useful and necessary for the common good. In order to attain this purpose, naturally, it is important that all of the avenues, all of the means, and all of the methods by which human beings can be morally, intellectually, and emotionally educated must be kept open. In periods of tyranny, in, the, in World War II in Europe, the moment dictatorships came into existence, the Masonic lodges were closed because it was assumed 
that these lodges would be the place where these dictators would have their greatest fear. Not because these lodges would actually and factually uh, act in any treasonable manner, but that individuals gathering in them as free human beings refusing to acknowledge man's bondage to man and accepting only man's service to God, that in these groups there would be levels of thinking which could never be controlled, could never be enslaved, and could never be brought down to the degradation which otherwise might have been possible. And it is also in this spirit that the freedom of men becomes important to their growth. Even an idealistic culture imposed upon man would fail. No individual can succeed by being given security. Until he earns it, he does not value it. Until he has learned its methods, he cannot communicate it. And without having merited security, the individual cannot bestow it as a heritage upon his issue. We can only share what we know, and we know only what we can do. Thus the simple process of action the communication of value from the one who possesses it to the one who needs it. This is the great purpose of the initiation rituals of ancient times. Not that the individual was to be given a secret, but that he was to be given a skill. The secret was he must earn it. He must earn it by patience, by self-discipline, by consecration. And having given so great an amount of himself to the attainment of the skill, he should certainly not cease there, but should realize that if it was worth attaining, it must be valuable. And if it is valuable, it can be valuable finally in only one way. It is valuable because of the truth in it. And the truth that is in it is the God behind it. And anything that is worth laboring for with diligence, is worth using well. And to wait and to labor long and, in, and arduously for some skill, only to waste the products of it, only to take a great ability and live a useless or comparatively valueless life, only to work hard in a great profession to attain a fortune to be squandered, this is not good philosophy nor is it good religion. The individual who is earning, who is laboring, should accept the responsibility not only for the skill and integrity of his labor, but for the skill and integrity of his usage of that which accumulates from his labor. The power to do came from God. The rewards of the doing belong to God. A man returns the profits of his toil to God by using them for the benefit of his fellow men. In substance, this seems to be the essential principle of Masonic philosophy, the growing up of the individual to these responsibilities one by one. We speak in no way officially, but this is what it seems we should gather and imply from the great landmarks of this craft.